13 Questions by Man Transcending Manhood in the Digital Age Welcome back to another episode of 13 Questions. Thank you for joining us once again. This guest that we have now is going to be Graham Gainsford. Uh, Graham is really cool, down-to-earth dude. Darren ran into him over on the Twitters, and, well, so happy that we were able to bring him here and share his answer to the 13 questions and the bonus questions. Uh, a little bit about Graham. Uh, he's a caretaker at Social Housing. Uh, he lives over on the other side of the pond. Um, and as of uh, this recording, he'll have been working there for 20 years. Um, as for his family life, he is a father of five and has a loving wife. So that is Graham in a nutshell. If you guys enjoy what you hear here, you can go to 13questionspodcast.com, become a member, get access to all of the goodies over there, the self-journaling courses, the TJ Walker communications courses, and of course, you get the bonus questions and bonus episodes that you hear right here at the end of the this episode, right? So uh, if you remember, it's just going to continue on afterwards. If not, well, get on your butt and go over and click the little button. Everything is in the show notes. And a quick note about the recording of this podcast before we jump in. The first two and a half minutes, Graham's audio sounds pretty wonky. I forgot to hit the record button on my primary audio, so I had to jump to my digital software recording and... Well, for some reason, it did not like Skype on his end and did some sort of crazy compression on it. But it is here, it is good, and I thank you so much for joining us. 13 Questions with Graham Gainsford. All right, so Graham, are you uh, you ready to jump on into the thirteen questions? Yeah, sure, sure, no worries. Phenomenal, phenomenal. I love it. I love it. All right, Graham, this is the uh, thirteen questions. Uh, you ready? Yep. Awesome. Question one: What was the best advice ever given to you, and would you modify it at all today? Ah. Uh. Well, I thought a lot about this question. The best advice that was given to me was when I was about 19 years old. I had a girlfriend at the time, and she, she had gone to university up in um, Lincoln. I'm in London. And uh, at the time, I was working, delivering Chinese food, and I would earn my money for the day, finish my work, uh, drive to Lincoln for one and a half hours, crash at my, my girlfriend's Halsey residence, and then during the next day, I'd go and walk around the city. And one particular day, I was sitting down the end of a road with a river, a stream, and a bench and some grass, and there was an old man sitting near the bench. I had nothing particularly to do, so I sat down and had a chat with him, and he gave me some advice. And he said to me, if ever you get a job that you can do, and you can keep hold of it for a long time, stick with it, don't give up, and just keep working. And, uh, yeah, I listened to him. And, and uh, was it two days ago, I've actually been working now as a caretaker in social housing for uh, 20 years. So wow. I would say that, that one, yeah. What was it about uh, that particular person that, that spoke to you as a as a young, young person? He seemed... Well, he was obviously at the end of his, um, or nearing the end of his life, or, you know, he was an older gentleman, of, um, retired, and, and you know, you know, sometimes you just know when, when people are talking in sense, and we seem to have some kind of a connection on that day, and, and I love the randomness of it as well, you know, just going out into the world and, and discovering stuff for yourself, and um, no, that's that's about it, really. To be honest with you, phenomenal. I love to hear that. That you know, because you kind of wonder, like, what happens to that that old wisdom that mm. you know that at least in that passing moment that you could take a lifetime of 
acquirement and regrets or or knowledge and just give it to somebody. That's a huge gift if you're just so, willing so, to listen. Some, some, something he did say to me, um, like when you're working a job, people spend a lot, of, well, not a lot, but people spend time in between jobs. And, and that time when you're not, when you're not employed, obviously you're not earning any money. So although the job you have might not be the best job in the world, having a constant income with no gaps, it sort of makes it better because you're not losing money in between. It's, it's one thing to have, if you've had a higher paying job for four years and then you spend another three years looking for different things and stuff like that, obviously it wipes the average straight down. And You know, I've found it, it's worked for me. But then I might have just worked here for twenty for twenty years anyway, so so who knows? You do, know. do you think it's something special, like a, an affinity for the job, or or a love or passion that other people don't have for uh, their positions? It's a long answer. Um, when I was a kid, I was raised in a tower block. Um, I was a single. My mum was a single parent. I had an older brother and a younger sister, half brother, half sister, and. In the, in the tower block that's obviously the estate I was raised on and I and I had a chance to get a job working as a caretaker in those exact same tower blocks that I grew up in as a kid and not only that I even because the job came with a flat at the time or an apartment you might say and um, when, I, when I got the flat I had the choice of either having the flat I was raised in as a child which was number 10 in Hamlet House or I could have the flat underneath it, which was number four Hamlet House. And um, yeah, I chose I chose the number four because the number ten was a bit too creepy. Yeah. What was the most important lesson you learned from your parents? Well, I didn't have a dad. It's the interesting part of this is, I, obviously, I had a mum, but my mum died in two thousand and three, I think. My mum died in 2003, and I do know who my dad is now, and he's still alive, and he's actually quite wealthy, but he doesn't want to have anything to do with me. Uh, we exchange emails every now and then, um, but it's just very generic crap that he scared, that he um, shares with me, and you know, like where he was born and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think the most important lesson I've learned now, now I'm married and got five children myself, is it's it's important. It's important to have a mum and a dad. Um, you know, it's, it's people say raising a kid like single mums can do it on their own and it's wonderful and stuff like that. Fair enough. They are like superheroes for doing all that kind of stuff. But if you can, if you can have a mum and a dad, then you know, that, 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 that's, that's the most important part. It doesn't matter how good or bad they are. Just the fact that they're, that, you know, that they're there and you've got those memories is I think the most important thing that I've learned. It's powerful. Oh, thank you. What, what book has been most influential on your life and why? Well, honestly, I haven't read a book since I left school. Um, so I, I could take the, the easy, cheap, the easy cheap way out and then, and say the Bible, um, occasionally, listen to passages on that and, and um, pay some attention. Not an awful lot, mind you. But, um, so I can't answer that, really. Do you, do you listen I, to any, I, like, I, uh, particular audiobooks or podcasts or anything that's been uh, particularly impactful on you? Podcasts? Oh, that's a different that's a different kettle of fish. Yeah, I mean, it is um, kind of the new, it's the new I'll, way to acquire language. I mean, it, it is essentially a book in a different form. Mm. I've worked my way through the History of England, the History of England po podcast, which is quite good. Um, obviously, I like Grime America. Um, Educational-wise, I would say, um, oh, what's it called? Oh, I can't remember now. Sorry. Who's the guy who does hardcore history? Uh, right? Hardcore history. Yeah. That, it, yeah. oh my gosh, I can't remember his name either. That's sad, isn't it? We should really know. He did a podcast with America as well, so we should we should really know his name. But yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, I like that one a lot. Yes, phenomenal. Was, Do you have any uh, uh, daily habits or rituals? Rituals? No, that sounds a bit um, 
new agey. I know, I know a lot of your listeners are new agey, but um, I, I don't count myself as one of those kind of people. Do you uh, have anything uh, like particular? It's, it's like... Get, get, getting up, waking up the house, turning the lights on, getting everyone out of bed and ready to get to school and get to work. And, you know, I'm always the first person up. Um, and there's, there's not really that much else to it, to be honest with you. I do like a good nap. If ever I can get a nap, then, then uh, my wife would say that's probably my favourite ritual to get yeah. out of the way. But living in a, living in a house with seven people. Oh, but I mean, you, you, you still have to take, it, you have to take the space where you could find it. And, yeah, uh, you know. it, it, it is a simple pattern of ritual. I know when I talked to Micah Hanks, he uh, he mentioned drinking coffee. You know, every morning, just oh, sitting love, down, love, getting love, the coffee, holding it in his hands, staring into the cup, smelling it. He's like that moment every morning. I'm like, yeah, that that's a ritual. That is a it's a a moment that you look forward to and embrace every single day. For me, that would be my bowl of cereal, and my cup of tea. Then I always take my bowl of cereal, and my cup of tea to work. And when, when I get to my first estate that I work on, I'll just quickly eat my t- eat my uh, cereal and drink my tea before I get started on whatever the day might bring. You know, messy bin rooms and whatever. What have you, uh, residents? What is your uh, what? Is, what is your uh, cereal of choice over there in uh, uh, the other side of the pond? It's the same sort of stuff that you have. It's um, wheat bix cornflakes, sugar puffs. You know, just normal stuff. Maybe some uh, muesli. Nice. If I were to ask your best friend, what is the one thing they would say you need to work on the most, and why? I asked my best friend this question today, and she answered me. Let me read what she wrote. I love this. Uh, I think it's asking what is your weakness. Well, you are a confident gent. You work hard. You provide for your family. So, not sure you can work on if you can work on those. Are you tolerant of others? Are you accepting of differences of opinion? Are you too opinionated? Could you improve certain skills? or improve ambition it's a massive question so yeah that's what she wrote nice well there I mean, you go no, straight it's, not from, very, it's not a very full answer or anything like that but it doesn't matter yeah. straight from the yeah. horse's mouth i, I you, you can't get any more accurate than that <laughs> interesting do you want to hear an interesting story about her yes absolutely a long time ago we used to work in a local delivery pizza hut together and since then, she's gone on to become a, a, a police sergeant in the Metropolitan Police. She was at the London Bridge attacks and she saw some pretty horrible stuff that shook her up. And, uh, you know, uh, and she's a really, really good person. And, and I put a lot of stock in, in what she says. And, and where it, through the passage of time, most people, most friends, they move on and move away and lose contact and stuff like that. But she's one of the few people, very few people, who's actually stayed in contact and, and pays me some attention, you know, real good friend. That's lovely. Yeah, yeah. Your, your police forces over there have such interesting, unique stresses going on right now. It's, oh, so it's crazy, something that it? people don't understand that you've got a, a weapons problem that it, it, it's on par with the gun problem in America now, but just on a, a different uh, different level. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, scary for your folks over there. Yeah, yeah, they, they don't get treated too well either by the um, higher-ups from, from what I hear from certain people, you know. Yeah, well, I feel bad for all the good ones over here in the U.S. because uh, they don't get treated well by the general populace. It's kind no, of been, no. when I was a kid, everybody loved the local, you know, policeman, you trusted him. Now, you know, wool's been pulled out, you know, from over people's eyes they kind of see what's going on and then once they see that corruption then they don't trust anyone and then that's just as bad it's a fractured society by design isn't it that's the thing (laughs) divide and conquer yep what are you most curious about well if you were to look at my swipe right on google you know the little on the android phone with the drop down and all the stories that come up uh, space it's always been space from Star Trek to the latest space podcasts and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself an intelligent person, but as far as interesting goes, it, or anything on the, on the outer edges of what we know and understand is, is, I find interesting. I'm not saying I do understand it. 
I, I'm just saying I find it fascinating to to pay attention to and, and you know read or, or listen to. Oh, I'm in the same uh, boat as you. I I pay attention to Ben Ben Davidson suspicious suspicious observers and you know learning all about how the sun weather affects the earth and has had you know <laughs> ties to Earth's history. It's it's fascinating to see what what our progression through science is allowing us to understand about our mm. world. That you and people said that you know the sun caused all these things that it wasn't just you know allegorical stories that there's science behind it. and it's really cool to see that kind of stuff you know start to come forward here you know mostly in the the, the later part of our uh, century here yeah my favorite two space podcasts are space nuts and space time with stuart gary they're both out of australia and i like i like listening to those two they're they're kind of like br- like brother podcasts to each other i like listening to those because they don't make any judgments they're they're not looking down their noses at certain sections of certain societies and sneering at people or their beliefs. I mean, they do come, they do say that global warming is a problem and it's real and stuff like that, but there's no demeaning people who might have different views. They just put the facts out there and, 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 and leave it at that. You know what I mean? Whereas when all this Trump stuff came along a good number of years ago, and I used to listen to other, other podcasts and, and then they, and they start running people down, and there's no need for it, you know. So, so I, I do like space time and and space nuts. They're my favourite. Phenomenal. Podcasts. I'm going to add those to my list because every uh, mm. every so often it's late at night or something. If I have nothing else that I can find on, you know, the the DVR or anything, I'll f- just see. Hey, what's going on with the the NASA live stream? You know, we got anything going up on the ISS? You know, what kind of educational programs do you have? So it's always nice to have uh, another podcast out there. I like download and listen to the Black Vault and some other ones that are kind of in that spacey right. realm. And um, so, yeah, that's really cool. And they're, re- they're really up to date as well. Twice a week, you get all, all the rocket launches when oh, Russia's launched a spy satellite. Phenomenal. All you all know, that that's kind of that's stuff, worth yeah. just listening on on its own. I'm down here in Florida, so I can see the ones when they go out of the Cape, uh, weather permitting, which is kind of mm. nice. But every app that I've ever downloaded or Alexa channel or whatever like that has just ended up not updating. It's not a very popular thing for people to use. So I'm in. You've sold me on this podcast. (laughs) I had a question on one of them. They answered one of my questions a while back. What was the most embarrassing or humbling experience of your life? The most embarrassing or humbling experience of my life. Oh, I've got some notes. Um, oh, yeah. Well, you know, the classics, teenage boys, parents. I actually got, um, when I was 12 years old, I got taken into foster care. And I uh, I went from being... Um, a poor kid in a single family, in a single parent family with not enough money at the end of the week and having water on your cereal and having everyone take the piss out of you and, you know, nonstop, all that kind of stuff. And I went, the the, the courts judged my mum to be um, unfit to look after me, which was strange because my brother and sister still stayed there. But never mind, I was a, a young tear away. I went to live with, I got placed with some foster parents and they were rich. I'm, I'm getting to the point. Um, and imagine pulling up in a social worker's car outside a really nice house in a really nice street and they've got really nice cars on the driveway and you just, you, you, it's like a Disney moment. You can't believe it's happening. And anyway, so I've, I've gone to live with my foster parents. I've been there for quite a while and, um, I was in my bedroom one afternoon doing what teenage boys do and my foster dad burst in through the door because he heard a noise he didn't recognize and he thought i'd stolen something and i was hiding it down my trousers and I, and I, and I protested in vain as much as i could but he still didn't believe me and so he came over to search me and then of course at that point he realized what was going on and i would say that's probably the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to me in my life to be completely honest with you that's hard to top. It is, yeah. But that's Stuck good. This long. That, that's good. That means you've got this really thick armor. Like, <laughs> well, how, how are you going to get under yeah. that skin? Now you've been there before. Yeah. Oh god. So yeah, split split your trousers in public. Pfft, you got this. Oh, it was it was embarrassing for both of us. Obviously, you know. But that's just life, isn't it? Yeah. These things happen. 
Exactly. It's the only way you can look at it. Mm, for sure. What is your greatest fear and how did you overcome it? Um, greatest fear. It's difficult, isn't it? There's so many things in the world to be frightened of. Um, but being the per like with the f- five children, I've got f- four sons and a daughter and got to pay the bills and keep everything going. And when my, when my um, wife got pregnant with our first child, I was pretty much a lost scumbag. I hadn't found my way in the world. I was getting a new job every two weeks. Couldn't hold anything down. Obviously, when I got this job, the one I've got now, I kept kept hold of it. But it was difficult because there's a lot of bad managers and horrible jobs out there. And I, I, I think my biggest fear is, is not being able to provide for my family, which is, you know, obviously quite important because I can, I can remember being cold and, and hungry right. and what, what, it, what it feels like to for your mum to have not paid the rent in time and she's putting your stuff into a shopping trolley outside your house because that afternoon they're coming to evict you. And uh, my, my granddad at the time, this actually did happen. My granddad, he didn't. He wasn't actually part of my mum's life, but he heard about this, and he he saved us. He saved us at the like literally the last few hours, and uh, so yeah, my biggest fear is not being able to provide for my family. That's phenomenal, and you've you've been able to see both sides of the coin. See, you know, both mm, both sides of that fence. Sure. You you had the. The opportunity. So now that later in your life, you know the extremes, you know the pitfalls on both sides, and y- right. you kind of really get to pick pick with you know the optimum road. Yeah, I mean, it is when I look at my children today, and and they don't understand. You know, they, they you say to them, it's so important to to get work and 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 to be reliable and all of those things and, and the driving forces that 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 make you get to those places I, I sometimes wonder you know how are they going to do it but of course they're the normal side of the coin and, and i'm the, the one who had the, the 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 more difficult side of the coin so we all learn to be people in different ways don't we mm-hmm. yep what qualities do you most admire in a man and why right now uh, how i see this question is growing up what people because I didn't have a father figure, apart from obviously my foster dad, but, you know, that was for five years. And he obviously is one of the people. But you choose who you learn, who you take lessons from in life. I had the, the, um, the, the ability or whatever you want to call it to, to find good people and, and take lessons from them. Obviously, one of them was my foster dad. Um, he taught me. I know this sounds ridiculous saying it now. But he taught me if you want something in the world, so you can go out there and work and actually attain that. Whereas before I'd gone to live with my with my foster parents, everything was benefits. Right. And, and, and you, you only know what you have learned. And if you haven't been in a situation to observe things, even as simple as that, then, then it doesn't become part of who you are. Um, so other, other people... Uh, when I was um, 15, 16, I had a Saturday job at a local motorcycle shop. The guy who owned it, his name was John Riley. And I went down there and I, was, I asked him if he had a Saturday job. He, he said to me, no, we haven't got anything at the moment. Come back next week. And I went back next week and he said, no, we haven't got anything at the moment. And this went on for about three months. And in the end, he gave me a, he gave me a, a Saturday job then. And to me, because I love motorbikes, that was... Um, like a really, really big thing. And later on, he, he told me that he was doing that. He was doing that, number one, to see if I was worth paying any attention to. And number two, to train. he was training me to be persistent and right. to keep trying to keep trying and not to give up. And um, that, that, that was a, another role model, I suppose. He's, he's passed away now, God, God rest his soul, but his motorbike shop's still there. None of the people who work there, obviously, remember me or anything, but... Yeah, he really he made a big difference to me in, have in you, a big uh, way. Have you taken that on to your own children, where you kind of you know uh, you're you're harder on them in ways that they don't understand because you're trying to just kind of you know uh, prepare them for the, the the world that they're moving into, so they can be better facilitated to walk through it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my oldest is twenty one. He's got mild autism, um, uh, and he's literally 
uh, I think it's something like 16% of people with autism in this country are in full-time work. Now, when the Conservative government came along and they started um, changing all the disability payments uh, four or five years ago, so three or four years ago, however long it was, all people with autism, they had automatic um, payments because they've got a lifelong condition. And, but the Conservatives changed it to, are you able to get a job? And then they deemed it as yes. So we've been growing up with the um, assumption that he's always going to have something to fall back on. Mm. And uh, they yeah, took they, it away from him. That's terrible. Yeah, and so, and so he's, we desperately tried to find him a job. He, he got a job at Sainsbury's working at, over there at Christmas. That's a supermarket. Um, working nights. Um, that was over Christmas, though. They let him go from that. And then he got a job at Amazon, um, which was not Christmas, just gone the Christmas before. About three months after Christmas, he got a job there with a work with a work agency. He was doing four hours a day, four days a week. It was it was a well, it was a couple of hundred pounds a month, but it was enough. It gave him pride. He managed to mm-hmm. pay us rent, and he did he did a good job there. He was doing a good job, and he worked there for nine months. And then, so quite recently. Just after Christmas just gone, they let him go. They just let him go. He turned up for work one day and they said, sorry, that's it. He knew it was coming because he saw him tra- training the new people to replace him. But I, I kicked up a big fuss, which was, uh, you know, I don't know whether I should have done that or not because obviously I've, I've flagged him up to the agency people now as, as trouble and all that. But but it turns out that anyone who works at Amazon on a temporary contract can only work there for nine months, don't matter how well you do your job. Wow, so, and that's got, crazy. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me yeah and, um, so, so some bean counter somewhere some insurance some reason has oh, yeah. uh, just you know put you into a p- file folder that's right and the other thing is they're running adverts saying how great it is to work at, um, at Amazon as well on the telly you can go to the factory and watch all the happy people doing their jobs and stuff like that and, I, and I'm sure that they probably do have full time people there who are very happy and stuff like that but that's not the whole story. No. They have, they, they, you know, there's a whole other swept under the rug side. All I mean, you have to tra- do is ask anybody that works for them or just mm-hmm. look at the local delivery truck driver because around here, they generally don't look happy. They're not like, no. I mean, compare them to a UPS driver who at like my job and around, you know, it's, you know, hi, mm-hmm. how you doing? Friendly. Like I know my local UPS driver at my house and my business, mm-hmm. my Amazon people, they don't want to say hi to me. <laughs> no. So, but anyway, so last Friday he's been applying for jobs online and everything. Oh, good. He, he got um, um, a job at TNT, and now he's working overnight. Excuse me, I need to cough. Sorry. <coughs> Very sorry about that. It's all good. I can take I'm it out good. in post. Cheers. I'm not used to talking this long. No, well, that's phenomenal that there's at least opportunities for him to work, even though it uh, kind of stinks that the government would do that. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I was just saying that it really is awesome. I knew that... where, the, where the mute button was. I'd push it. <laughs> it's okay. I was just saying that uh, it's it's really it's really cool that he at least has some opportunities to work over there, even though the government has you know pulled out the support structure. You know, yeah, I mean, it could be a most, lot worse. He's doing the most difficult thing. He's working 10 at night till 6 in the morning, Monday to Friday now. Oh, yeah, absolutely, because so, that can start messing with circadian rhythms and all sorts of other things. So, yeah, it's a, he, it's a tough road. Yeah, his, his, his circadian rhythm isn't the best anyway. So, what with his autism and that, he does like to stay up late at night. But but he's out, he's out there doing it, you know. He's, he's willing to try anything, and he's going to succeed. So, that's the most Phenomenal. important thing. I'll tell you what, half the people on the planet don't have that right there. So, you know. <laughs> that's right. That's right, yeah. Who were uh, and are your role models and why? I thought, oh man, I already answered that question, didn't I? I did. I, I did it with the um, wisdom. Yeah. No, was it? Yeah. So, so it's, it's my foster dad, foster Derek, dad, and uh, John Riley. Uh, really, he's it's, it's, it's going back to the same, the same thing. Seeing seeing what you admire, what you admire in people, and. I mean, I, I, had, I had a bit of a flippant answer. I, I was going to say Jesus and Superman. But, uh, yeah. <clears throat> that, that's about it, really. Sorry. No, no. I actually, it's, it's funny. I, I actually like that because, you know, the, some of the greatest stories of time are some of the most impactful things because they teach you knowledge. It's not even knowledge. They teach you wisdom. It's, it's something that you can't get. It's the allegory of the story makes sense when told through another form. So 
yeah, Jesus, Superman, and you know your your father. It's uh, it makes sense to me. Well, with, with the Superman thing, I've there's um a phrase that I found to be very very true, and it's um as the son becomes the father, so the father mm-hmm. becomes the son. <coughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, like I say, as the son becomes a father, the f- the father becomes a son, and and for me, the truth of that, I I, I found you know quite emotional as as um, I started to raise my family, and you know the first time as a dad, I would do things with my children, and it wasn't the first time for them, it was just the first time for them. It was the first time for me as well. Mm-hmm. So I learned about a lot of the time. I learned about what having a father means by being a father and and I'm not by any chalk imagination saying that I've done an excellent job or anything like that, but it's still very illuminating, you know? Well, I mean, it was your first time doing it. It's, uh, you know, how, how can anybody do it right the first time, even the second time, you know, it's just one of those things. Just a simple thing of like a dad giving a son a hug, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that uh, me giving my son a hug was me giving my son a hug and the first experience of a father giving a son a hug. Do you know what I mean? That, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. What institution of society or structural aspect of modern life would you change given the chance? Blah is my answer to that. That's a very wide ranging question, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Um, it's uh it's my favorite question of the the lot that we have here. Mm. I, I think maybe national service. I, 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 I would like to see youngsters given more of a, um, an, an, an identity as far as their own country goes because there's so many um, there's so many things splitting people away from the love for their country these days that and you know. by that, do you mean like uh, a national enlistment? So uh, at a certain age, everybody joins <coughs> like the military or something? Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, being part of the, you know, going, like, like they're doing Israel, everyone has to be part of the military mm-hmm. for a certain number of time. And it teaches people discipline, respect for yourself, respect for others, all, all those kind of things, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've had some uh, Finnish friends who, uh, yeah, it, it it certainly has a very uh, noticeable impact on the the culture of uh, people. You, mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, and people just you know teamwork in just, you know adverse they just conditions. More resourceful as well, you know. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, because everybody's had to be through it. You mm. know, <laughs> you know, people make fun of millennials today, but a lot of it's just they're sheltered. You know, That's if not, if you uh, haven't uh, been exposed uh, to uh, things, how how do you know? But when you're forced into the wilderness, the hardness, and fighting for yourself, if needed, that's I mean, that's that's when it gets real. And what with all the different communities we've got in in the, in in our countries now, it'd be good to have something that forced them to work together. And then they'd have more respect for each other as well, you know. That, that, that's my theory, anyway. It's pretty simplistic, I know, but that's how I answered that question. So. What is the most courageous thing that you have ever done or seen in your life? Uh, I have to say, um, the most courageous thing I've ever seen in my life is my wife giving birth, because it's a miracle. It is a miracle, um, and the most courageous thing on that line i've done our third son matthew when he came out he was blue obviously you got to understand mum's laying down she can't see what's going on mm-hmm. and um i can see let's put it that way and he wasn't breathing when he came out and it was the most shit scaring time of my entire life because you're there you can see basically he's dead and the doctors whisk him away. They're doing whatever it is they do over in the corner and you know, and, but she doesn't know. And she's looking at you and she's saying, is everything okay? Is everything okay? Please tell me everything's going to be okay. And you can't. And, and she, well, this is the thing, isn't it? And, and you know that everything's not okay, but she needs you in that moment. And in that moment, you've got to be certain because Anything less than that, and, you, and you're, you're you're failing. I don't know what you're failing at, but you're failing. So yeah, um, 
I told her everything was going to be fine and not to worry. And then, like, for what seemed, obviously, at the time, it was an eternity. But I think it was, a, like, less than four minutes in total, the whole thing. And then you hear, you hear, you hear, because they're sucking out his airwaves and whatever it is they do. And then you hear just this faint little scream. And, you know, I can kind of feel the emotion coming back to me now, just talking about it. And, and then when you hear that first gasp, it's just like, oh, thank God. And then, and, and, and you just get flooded with you know, happiness and tears, and you know it's just such a magical moment, you know. And so that that yeah, when you said just four minutes, no, that's an uh, eternity. eternity. Sure, yeah. Yeah, oh my God, that yeah, that especially in that moment because there's only one place to focus. It's you're not dealing with anything. It's time, time, and and waiting and wonder. That I'll tell you what, that's that's an incredible moment to have because it just it, it can just juxtapose all the beautiful wonderful moments that come forward from there yeah yeah there's been a lot so you know. what does it mean to be a man in today's world man well when we were sitting down earlier on and i was running through these questions with my wife and trying to you know just spitball some answers which is basically all i got a spitball version in my hand here one of my sons piped up and he said it's the same as what it's always been and and i thought i thought to myself i was trying to think of a clever answer or or you know all that kind of stuff but no he's right mm -hmm. all this all this modern technology all these modern ways of thinking everything like that it's it's, it's all a blip it's the tiniest blip on the radar that maybe what, if you're lucky, goes back 80 years. How long we've been around for tens of thousands of years as, as a as a species, I believe. And and, and and for the vast, vast, vast majority of that time, it's been a man's responsibility to look after his family, to make the world safe, to make the world safe for his family and by extension all other people. And and I, I think Today, in today's world, a man's responsibility is the same as what it's always been. It's just there's so much more distractions. And it's a lot easier to think that the, those aren't, that it's not the same. But really and truly it is. I mean, and there's been my life experience. I've been lucky enough to have been able to get a job. I mean, it's not a very good job, not a very well paid job. But it's been enough that my wife, she managed to stay at home with the children um, for the first number of years. She, she works in a, in a school now. She put herself through uh, um, Open University and got herself a degree. She did it all on her own. But just the traditional values, they're, 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 they worked for a reason. I'm not saying tie a woman into the kitchen. I'm not saying that men are better than women or anything like that. But but the responsibility is the same. I, I, think, I think that... All this hype and all this, you know, diversion and different sexes, dare I say, God, um, you know, just stick with what works. Well, stick with what works. I think you nailed it there. Yeah, things worked for a reason, and it's not because you have no, to do no. this. Look, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. But guess what? Women are drawn towards having children, not all, and that's fine. But if you yeah. are and you're drawn towards that, in a, like that family, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge part of what our culture is and who we are as human beings mm -hmm. and the way that we just mold and define our world. So, yeah, it is kind of weird when people want to scrap and silence that and, you know, uh, toxic yes. masculinity and you go, yeah, well, you know, the same violence that can make a man so aggressive and terrible is something that if they're protecting their family is a very much needed juxtaposed thing. And I don't know how to articulate it properly, but you know, there's, there's a balance and we're just, we're whatever world we're moving into. We seem to be missing that. I think, I think there's a beauty in toxic masculinity. I think that um, all these people that are against all those kind of things, you know, fair enough. Sometimes they, they make good points and stuff like that, but just to throw the whole thing out, as if it's some massive mistake or, you know, that it's wrong. It, it's, it, it, there, there's, there's something, they're throwing something glorious away at the same time. I mean, look, look at your, um, 
Man Cal Mullers from from Chicago, the radio DJ, or Al Bundy from Married with Children. Everyone knows Al Bundy. Mm-hmm. He's one of the biggest male chauvinist people on the face of the planet. But boy, could he make you laugh. Now, fair enough. I understand people want to throw away the the the, the man piggishness of it all. But the laughter, the ability to look at a situation and make a joke out of it, they're all part of it. They're a vital part of it. And, and and I think the world would be a sadder place without that kind of stuff in it, to be completely honest with you. I hijacked that a bit there, didn't I? No, that's good. I, I completely agree. It was yeah. a perfect place to hijack. That was actually yeah. the the end of the first 13 questions, Graham. That was that was fun. That was fun. But the good news is we got a bonus round. Yeah. If, if it's a round. It, it's just uh, another uh, seven or eight questions. Yep. Sweet. Well, you ready to uh, jump ahead? I am indeed. Yep. Ah, great. Graham, what do you Yo. hope people will say at your funeral? Uh, jokey answer. Someone else came. <laughs> uh. But no, um, I, I think uh, I would like, obviously, I'm hoping my children will be there. Um, I would like them to say, to recognize that I might not have been a very successful human being, but I stuck to what I knew and I never gave up. That, that's probably about it, really. Would you like to hear a story about my mum's funeral? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, funerals are, um, they're well, very, yeah, go ahead. Oh. <clears throat> How my mum died. How my mum she passed, she had a, what's called a spontaneous, a spontaneous intercerebral hemorrhage, is what the coroner told me. And um, she was basically in the WC in her home, and she died like that. So it's, it's like um, a, kind of like an aneurysm? Or? Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I, I found my mum. Mm. Um, she was dead on the floor, and my my older brother, he was married to a woman at the time, not anymore. My older brother, they had um, insurance, uh, life insurance, so they paid for the funeral and everything like that. And it was a while about, I didn't have any money, so I couldn't have done it anyway. But because they arranged everything and organised everything, everything, um, they decided that no one was going to speak at the funeral in case people said things that weren't liked and stuff like that. So we went to the funeral... The priesty man said stuff and she was cremated. And that was that. Also, I thought until a year later, we get a phone call saying, um, is someone going to come and collect the ashes? Which is pretty shocking to me. Why 
how some people can't say nothing nice Why do we always gotta question what all of it means And why won't you follow your dreams Tell me why The night when you took my dad Why'd you let me see my grandpa cry And tell me why And why do you choose to hide Even though you was born to fly And tell me why And why don't we turn from all the hate And why don't we learn from all mistakes Why do I keep on wrecking these fat beats And teachers don't make more than professional athletes And why This should be considered entertainment and not therapy. We hope you benefit from our resources available at 13questionspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.